Welcome to PCG Live and a very happy National Freelancers Day to you. Today I'm joined by Peter Ibbotson, who is the Chairman of Small Business at the Royal Bank of Scotland, and also Jane Atherton, who is the Business Editor of The Metro. Now we'll be taking your questions for the next half an hour on all things freelance. So if you do have any questions for Peter or for Jane, you can tweet them using the hashtag NFD. 2013. Right, let's uh, kick off then, shall we, with uh, a question from uh, George Sills, uh, who is in Ipswich, who says, I feel like freelancers are forgotten about when people talk about small businesses. Is this because freelancers need to speak up more or is there something else wrong with the system? George, what do you think? Uh, George, I think actually most people would think that uh, a freelancer is a small business. And I think most people would struggle to differentiate between the two of those. Mm -hmm. I don't think you are forgotten in any way. Uh, and I think all the evidence is that freelancers are growing. I think the, the latest stats I've seen say there's nearly two million freelancers in the country. And actually it's an, an increasing trend. I think we're, we're going to see the trend increasing more and more with the employment issues in this country. Uh, people wanting more lifestyle jobs, things like that. So I think we're going to see the trend going up. So no, I, it's not a forgotten community, I'm sure. Except, except I don't think a lot of freelancers see themselves as small businesses. Mm. They see themselves very much as self-employed, yeah. don't yeah. they? Um, and I think, I think one of the problems that probably George feels is that they don't perhaps have that the same reach as a small business does, the same branding. And I would say to George, well, you have to try and develop that brand so that you can stand as almost in the same um, sphere as a small business does with all of its logos and its and its official yeah, you branding. See, you you see, that's quite interesting for me because I think they are small. I think, I think freelancers are small businesses. I mean, we have about four and a half million SMEs businesses in this country. Uh, well over half of those are owner-managers. And actually a freelancer is an owner-manager of their own destiny. So the do you think they're afraid of actually seeing themselves in that, in that role? Yeah, I, I suspect many don't sort of see themselves as a small business. But you, if you just step back for a second and say, so what's the difference between you as a freelancer and an owner-manager of your own company? There's probably very, very little difference. Is it to do with uh, whether you're operating on your own or whether you actually employ other people as well? For example, if you're, uh, you have some kind of service company but you're still a freelancer and you employ other people, if you are just one person, is it hard to see yourself as, if you are just one person, as a business? Well, as I say, about two million of the businesses in the country are owner-managed business, owner managed business so working for themselves. You're sole traders. So it's the same thing. Uh, and I actually don't think it really matters whether you see yourself as a business or, or you see yourself as somebody just working for yourself. Mm -hmm. And the key issues are what are the issues that affect you and many of those issues are the same as the issues as, a, as an owner-manager. Okay, well let's move on. Uh, Catherine Gibbs um, from Lincoln. My son is in sixth form doing business studies, but they've hardly mentioned anything about freelancing. Now, I've been a freelancer for 12 years and I love it, so why don't schools include it in the curriculum? Well, I think that is a, a, a something that, that maybe education and even the government could work on because, you know, we have... Um, very, very difficult situation where lots of people don't feel as though they can afford to go into university. Um, we have about a fifth of graduates coming out of university not being able to get a job. Um, and I think freelancing really could be a way for them, even if they wanted to be an, a, an employee in the future, it might be a way for them to really raise their profile in, that, in, the, in the sector that they want to work in. So yes, I, I definitely think that freelancing needs to be incorporated into education as, as a career option. Do you think it's likely that that would happen? Oh, well, yes, I do, right? Uh, why? And, you know, I am four square with Catherine on this. We absolutely should. Having the curriculums at school, all this about you can work for yourself, because, you know, you're right, Jane, there are going to be loads of people coming out of university now who actually are going to have to do that in their working life. And, you know, I've got two kids, one's 30, one's 26. Both of those at some stage have done freelancing because actually there were no other jobs there for them to do. So it is really important that within schools we do encourage people just to think about freelancing as one of the options available to them. I think it's a very natural thing for young people to think about as well actually because I know my son who's 16 actually does a freelance business on YouTube. You know, So it, it's something that they're very, very comfortable with because of technology and, because, and they have a very, very um, well-defined idea about how you can sell your skills and offer your skills to a, a global community, never mind uh, a domestic one. Do you know, you never start too early on this. I was at the Great British Enterprise Awards uh, the night before last, and there was an award winner there who was aged nine. 
Yeah. Right, so you can never start too early with this, but look, we should be doing it in schools, yes. Um, this is uh, another one. Well, this is one for you, really, Peter. You started your own business. I think that was back in 2003, is that right? Yeah. What uh, advice would you give those who are starting, starting up now? You know, the major piece of advice is talk to people. Um, it is a lonely, lonely place when you start your own business, and particularly if you're working on your own, particularly if you're a freelancer. You know, you've got to go out there, win contracts, you've got to get the money collected in, you know, you've got to do the money. It doesn't always come in, in at the same time, it's lumpy and all this. It's a lonely place. Do I charge VAT? How do I manage mm -hmm. the tax? Look, go out and talk to people. Don't be scared of taking advice. Talk to your peers, talk to an accountant, talk to a banker talk to a lawyer, you know, don't go and run up great bills taking expensive advice, just go and talk to people. Talk to people in the same sector, talk to your peers. Uh, it's quite interesting, whenever people start thinking of starting their own business, the place they most go to for the first advice is the pub. <laughs> right? They sort of lean on the counter and they ask somebody, what do you think about do this? Mm. Right? So, you know, just talk to people. I think that's the worry though, isn't it? I mean, I think a lot of people out there will, will wonder exactly how you build those chan channels, how would you how would you meet people who might be generous enough to give you that information? It's not, it's not generous, Jane. I mean, there are two million people out there doing it themselves at the moment. There's another two and a half million people out there who have done it and now employ people as well. Those people are very, very happy to give of their advice. They're actually quite proud to say, look, when I did it, I did this. So whenever anybody says to me, you know, what are the challenges you faced in doing it? <coughs> you know, I'll count them on, on the finger of, Two hands, probably. <laughs> and how did you get round it? And where did you go for that advice? So look, talk to people. Mm, okay, that question was from Shane Hurst in uh, Matlock. This one from Cameron Lavender from Reading. Why can't it be made easier for freelancers to work in the public sector? It's a nightmare. Is it difficult to work in the public sector? More so? What do you think? Yeah. Why? Yeah, um, and it's getting better. So the good news is the government we have now is making it much easier for you to win procurement contracts if you are a small business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is tough because you know you're up against bigger businesses that are that are pitching and they have stronger balance sheets, they have track records. Uh, it's often safer to use a big business than it is to use a sole trader or a freelancer. So yeah, there are challenges there. Uh, so it is tougher. It, it, it is getting better, but the thing you have to do is make yourself known, go and speak to those public sector organisations where you want business from. Build up the trust, build up the dialogue, uh, you know, build up the uh, relationship, and, and the then start pitching for it. The government tries to do that during the Olympic bid process, doesn't it, in terms of trying to make those um, channels open to smaller businesses in that they might be able to get some, a slice of that Olympic business. Um, but does, does that happen in other areas? Yeah, it does. I mean, let me give you a really graphic example of this. I had a breakfast yesterday morning uh, in the House of Commons. They've now moved from their traditional water that they use, which was a big branded named water, to a small business that produces water. So, yeah, they do it. They do it. They're hard yards. You know, you've really got to get in there and make a lot of noise. The opportunities are there to do it. It's about building relationships then. Mm -hmm. Um, Rachel Sutherland from uh, Time Etc is watching online and asks, do you think there's been an increase in attention from the media surrounding freelancers and if so, why do you think this is? Now she doesn't say whether she thinks it's um, uh, negative or positive negative attention, or but if, positive. It's, if anyone refers to it, the media generally it's, it's what they perceive as negative. So if we presume that she's talking about negative attention, do you agree that there's been an increase in that attention and what would you put it down to? Go on, Jane. You're a journalist. Why are you <laughs> negative about this? I think it depends which sections, sections of, of the media you're looking at. I mean, if you're looking at news stories, then may, I think maybe um, the big message coming out is that they are, you know, might be a neg there might be a negative side to freelancing. Particularly, I know that a lot of unions have been protesting that firms are taking on freelancers over full-time employees and, you know, all, all of the issues regarding employment rights and so forth that, that spring from that. Um, people be hiding behind limited companies in order to, you know, get tax breaks and mm -hmm. avoid uh, tax avoidance. Um, but if actually, if you look at the business pages and if you if you look at uh, at how businesses are trying to respond to the to the upturn, we hope upturn in the economy, then I think I don't think I think it is more positive message coming coming out in that small businesses particularly can use freelancers just to to get in that expertise and that those extra hands that they need to be able to respond to any kind of upturn um, 
when they don't have to take on the risk of maybe taking on full-time employees? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think you're right. I agree with you, Jane. I mean, I think there are three angles to it in a way. Um, one is all the great good news stories. So the journalists, I think, are, and you know, certainly Jane in, in, in Metro, you know, always up for this, a really good news story about somebody who's gone out there, done it, and created some GDP value, some growth, some economic value to the country. Really interest in those really good news stories. I think there is an interest as well in the, the sort of movement to using freelancers rather than having uh, full-time employees there. So using the expertise, the specialisms that are there on a short-term basis for a specific purpose. I think there's real interest in that because that's a changing model. And you know there is a trend where businesses are doing this more and more and more. And I, th I think the ability for freelancers to be very agile in a way um, contributes to that because you can you can bring in talent which maybe not even be in your geographical That's right. Area. No, absolutely. Um, so that, that you know, pool of talent is there. But the third point, I think, which does get to the negative piece, is IR35. So, you know, the, the tax implication and whether you're seen actually to be hiding behind a limited company or a service mm. company to avoid paying national insurance. And that's the negative bit. And that, mm. that, you know, when I talk to freelancers and small businesses a lot of the time, is a real worry for them about that they, they think they're doing the right thing. But actually, are they being seen, perceived, to be on the wrong side of the line? Mm. Well, it's all down to, I suppose, how, how they're advised, really, isn't it? Um, I mean, they, a lot of freelancers who feel perhaps that they are um, doing something that is perceived as not very good or perhaps a bit dodgy, that's, that's you know, they're, they're being told what to do. They're being advised by, by their accountants. I think that's right. But I think the issue is, you know, is the line very clear or yes. is the line a bit grey? Yeah. So, you know, the vast, yeah. vast majority of freelancers will be doing it for all the right reasons mm. and will not be breaching or seeking to mm -hmm. breach in any way IR35. But, but, but you're never absolutely sure. A, policymakers have um, a part to play in that as well because I think if they made the law a little bit clearer, the yeah. then, then it would be very, very easy to, to report those kinds of issues in a much more positive light. Mm. Uh, this question from uh, Barry Tutlin in Middlesbrough. When will the Labour Party understand that I'm not a vulnerable worker because I'm a freelancer? I chose to go freelance. Um, I mean, I don't want to get too much into the politics, but, but is, is there a perception from some political parties who perhaps are you know, currently in opposition that being a freelancer is, uh, well, poor you kind of thing? Do you, do, you, yeah, do you feel that? I think so. I think touching on what I just, uh, just said about, uh, in regards to the previous question, mm -hmm. I think... I don't know what the Labour Party says officially, but uh, I would imagine that there are certain elements of the Labour Party who might feel that freelancers really removes you from um, protections. protections. Mm. Um, so I think probably they, that perception comes, stems from that whole idea that really a f being a freelancer means that you don't have the protection of an employer, um, that you can be um, dismissed with or hired at the whim of employers. Mm. Um, but that's, that's quite an old-fashioned view, to be yeah. perfectly honest. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a spectrum here, and there'll be this sort of hard-left union view that probably does say that you, you lose some of the protections, so it shouldn't be allowed. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, you'll have the right-wing view that says everybody should be an entrepreneur and go out there and do it. Mm. And, you know, I think the reality is probably somewhere in the middle. But I've not sensed from any political party whether it be Labour, whether it be Lib Dems, whether it be Tories. I've not sensed anything that says, actually, we think freelancing is the wrong thing to do. Uh, and I'd probably say quite the reverse. I mean, I think the, the general there message is... There is a huge gulf, isn't there, between it. the zero-hours employee, yeah. employee and the, the freelancer yeah. who has actually yeah. chosen uh, absolutely. That, absolutely. that employment absolutely. path. I don't get the two getting confused. Yeah. Yes, perhaps. I think so. Um, well, staying with uh, politics, but again, just very generally, uh, Jackie Thomas from Sheffield is lamenting. I'm fed up of political parties, that's all of them, saying that they're on our side but never doing anything. Why do you think they have so much difficulty standing up for us? Have any of the political parties specifically done anything for freelancers? Well, OK, so you live in Sheffield, go and tap on the door of the Deputy Prime Minister, I guess, who's your local MP. It's probably a great place to start. <laughs> but, you know, the sense I have is that all the politicians are actually very, very keen to see individuals in employment, uh, contributing to the economy, adding to GB, mm. adding to Great Britain, all right? Um, so I don't, I don't sense any of them are there saying we shouldn't be supporting people to do this. The question then comes in, so what are you doing to make my life easier? What are you doing really to encourage me to do this? Uh, in the 10 years I've been running a business, um, 
it's probably a little bit easier to do it now than it was 10 years ago. Uh, there's still a great regulatory burden there. When you fill your VAT returns in, it's a frightening experience. And every, every year you get an email saying, will you please redo your company details and update us? Yeah. And I always say, why? Nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do it, you get fined 40 quid. So you do it and get charged 26 or whatever it is pounds for doing it. And things like that are a frustration. Um, but I certainly sense the politicians do actually want to see people creating opportunity, doing the business. They all understand that we're in a changing world. There are less mainstream jobs around now than they were in the early 20th century when we were a sort of an industrial country. So I think they're I all think pretty supportive. I, mean, I don't think any political party would want greater unemployment figures no. than, than, than fewer. So um, I think the issue is that it, it's, I think it's quite a slow process and it's a cultural process yeah. as well. So it's not just the business side that, that you've just described. It's really about education. Yeah. It's about educating businesses themselves to be more amenable to taking on freelancers. Yeah. It's about educating freelancers um, in widening out their appeal and having the confidence to approach different businesses, isn't it? It's, it's, it there's it, so many boxes think, that you have to tick. I think it's tick. a big cultural thing as well, and I think the generation that's now coming out of school, I mean, if I sort of wind back, that's about 40 years when I came out of school and went into a job, the assumption was you had a cradle to grave job. So you went into a job and you were still there at age 60 and you came out with a nice pension and that was your life. The general sense I have, certainly speaking with my kids and, and you know, their peers, is you know, we can do a job there for a couple of years, then perhaps we can go away for a year. Uh, so it's a lot more fluid now. So I think there's a whole piece about this cultural thing and mindsets and, and school that says actually this may be a route that we are moving it's into. It's culture. It is the yeah. culture. It's changing. I think culture and perception are really important here. Uh, let's talk a bit about the image of freelancing. Jessica Murray from Dunfermline. People say freelancing means you can always sit at home and work in your pajamas all day. But as we know, this isn't the case. When will we get rid of this stigma? When I work, when I work at home, am I in my pajamas? I'm saying you don't have to. Answer answer that. That. If, I, if you're in your pajamas and you're doing a piece of work and you're emailing it to somebody, does it really matter if you're in your pyjamas? I think that there's the whole idea that you have to be suited and booted in order to work, that you have to be in an office in order to work, is really, really old fashioned. I mean, of course you will be in a smart suit when you're meeting somebody. And um, surely that's all I, that's required. Know, I think you're bang on. Uh, it, it's really interesting. Somebody said to me the other day, can I work at home? I had a conversation with a lady saying, are you any good at working at home? And am I any good at working at home? And, uh, and she said, yeah, I'm really good. I'm, well, I'm very disciplined. And she said to me, am I any good at working at home? And I said, well, do you know, sometimes it goes to 11 o'clock and I've been up since 8.30 working or 7 o'clock work, whatever it is, and the sun's shining. Sometimes I say, do you know what? I'm going to go out for an hour and walk the dog. Yeah. But then I'm working till 8 o'clock tonight. And do I feel guilty about that? No. This is, look, this is a personal thing. You will know whether you're sufficiently disciplined to be productive working at home. Mm. But production can mean a lot of different things, can't it? And if you actually think about life in your average office, lots of people will be chatting to a friend for yeah. 10 minutes, yeah. going to the canteen for yet another cup of tea, and yet why should you feel less guilty about doing that in an office no, than at yeah. home? I don't, I don't think it's a thing about guilt, Jane. I think it's more about... Do, am I any good at working at home? And if you're a freelancer and you're no good at working at home, then don't do don't it. You know, go and find a little yeah. service office somewhere and, and do it in that way. But the question is more, when will we move away from mm. this perception that working from home is a bad thing? Mm. Uh, look, we're going to see far more working from home in the years to come than we've ever seen in the past. You know, when I first went into business, nobody ever worked from home. Now an awful lot of people do work from home. But look, as a freelancer, be dead honest with yourself. It doesn't matter what people think about you. You have to be productive because it's you that mm. you're working for. And if you find it tough to sit down and be disciplined and do it, then go and find it's a little about your service own office somewhere. Motivation, it but is. you know, it you is. know, productivity isn't just about working as you do in an office. So I don't think you no. necessarily I, have look, to feel that I, way. I get far more done when I'm working at home because you're not getting the, the, the distractions. No I get far more done in an audio conference than I do in a meeting face to face with people because mm -hmm. there's no chit chat, there's no waste of time. You're really disciplined. You get on and do it. Uh, but it is a personal thing. Make mm -hmm. sure you're good at doing it. Um, Cheryl Greensway from Harrogate says, and this is quite a specific but very interesting query, I've just finished a project for a client who is a big business. It's been two months and they still haven't paid me. I rely on that income, but I don't want to jeopardise future contracts because this client is pretty major. What can I do? Oh, Cheryl, welcome to the world of working for yourself. <laughs> right. 
Um, I don't, honestly, in the last three, in the last 10 years when I've had a business, I don't think anybody has ever paid me on time. Um, I apologize if one or two have done, right? But this is how it is. And there is always this dilemma between, shall I knock on the door and say, you owe me money, please, I need it. Look, the best advice I can give you is a business will respect you when you get the contract, when you say, and I need paying on time because I am a freelancer and this is how the world, world works in freelancing. So don't be afraid of just having that gentle word and saying, the bill's due, do you mind paying it? So do right. they just have to accept that maybe they will have to be on the phone to the accounts department? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that's yeah. part of the burden, really. Absolutely, all right? Big but business, big business will not, as a matter of course, pay on time, all right? Oh, really? What, the bigger you are? Big businesses do not pay on time. <laughs> that now, seems however, a bit perverse. However, well, it, there is a two sides to the equation, right? Mm. There is a very good financial reason why you sit on your cash as long as you sure. can because it helps your cash flow. Mm. The other side of the equation is to be a decent, good, big business, you ought to pay businesses, small, small employees, freelancers on time. But the reality of life is that the bigger the business, the tougher it is to get paid on time. So just face reality. That's how it is. And there's a, there's a pile of stuff the government is doing to try and make businesses pay on time. There's a prompt payment code, all the stuff's going out, and that's all really good stuff. But world of reality, expect the bills to be paid late. So knock on the door. I don't say make a nuisance of yourself so you don't get another, bill, uh, another contract, mm. but say, I really need paying. Should there be a cut-off point? Because she's talking about two months. Well, look, there, there's some legislation there that says when you're not paid on time, you can actually go to the person that owes you money and you can charge them at 8% over base rate as a penal interest rate because you're paid late. Right. I've yet to find a freelancer, a sole trader, a small business that has ever done that. Mm -hmm. Of course we don't do that because that's just going to mean you're not going to win the next yeah. contract. But it's perfectly fair to say to the person that owes you the money, when am I going to get it? Because I've got to work my cash flow out. So just having that confidence, really, that you're going to be respected for yeah. as, as, a, yeah. as a service provider and, and, and building that chasing time into your, yeah, you into need, your job. You need to build the chasing time, and that's right. And you do need to build into your cash flow the fact that it's going to be two or three weeks late. But it's perfectly fair to ask the person who owes your money, when's it coming in? Please stick to that. And if it's going to be three weeks late, that's fine. I know it's going to be three weeks late. You and don't have to do it in an aggressive way either, do no. you? You can just like a little phone call, perfectly polite, but regular and insistent. Yeah, they'll get the message. Yeah, I mean, she may have already done that, but um, I mean, all the advice that you've given is, is very helpful. Um, Rachel Headley in Cardiff, I've just had a baby, but I'd want to carry on working. Would freelancing help me balance my work and family life? I presume she means as opposed to going straight back into the office. What do you think? Um, I think you have to be a bit careful about um, imagining that coping with a small baby and also doing a job is an easy is an easy yeah, task. You were talking about distractions weren't you? Yeah and also you know having had a baby you know I know that um, that's a whole job in, on it on itself so I think it's fine and I and I, I certainly think it's it's a fabulous option for many many women who just want that extra time in terms of getting rid of commuting time being able to work in different ways as we've already discussed about working from home or working remotely um, and I think it's a perfect um, way to keep your uh, professional profile up at the same time as you know being there for your child in certainly in the in the very first stages mm -hmm. um, and uh, lots and lots of women have come to freelancing because of that haven't they because businesses just haven't been flexible enough or can't be flexible enough to to allow them those kinds of working patterns yeah I mean the fastest growing sector of freelancers at the moment is uh, women who've just had a baby and want to work as a freelancer at home maybe, but w managing their own time, I guess, is the, is the, the real key. I mean, Jane, you've been there more, far more than I've been yeah. there with mine. Um, but I think it's managing your time that's the real attraction to that. But yeah, the biggest growing sector that's there. And interestingly, one of the other things I do, I'm a director on the startup loan company. Um, and just yesterday, the government announced that startup loan companies' loans are now being made available far more uh, uh, aggressively. Uh, we want far more mm. working mums, people who just had a baby, actually to benefit from startup loan companies as well. Well, the whole so idea of mum entrepreneur has been a huge success, yeah. hasn't it, yeah. just in the last couple of years? Yeah. And, you know, it, it's just great because I know a lot of mums who do it will see the kids to bed and then put four hours in in the evening, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it, sounds and horrendous. And it's, and it's, a great, it's a great way to introduce <laughs> your newborn to the world of work as well, have, isn't it? If you have your own business, yeah. it's hugely rewarding. Course, and I, and yeah. I, know that, I know that a lot of women feel 
a huge amounts of satisfaction if they have a really great day of being with their children mm -hmm. and also running their own businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, this is another practical query. Uh, Helen Jordan in Liverpool. I went freelance because I thought I could work outside the city, but my broadband is so horrendous that I can't get any work done. What would you do to improve the situation? I'm presuming that it, it's not really to do with the provider, it's just to do with her, with her geography. Um, what can she do? Because clearly, I mean, we know this is something that a lot of people have lobbied for, you know, better rural broadband, etc. But she's a bit stuck, really, isn't she? So you're talking to somebody that lives in North Yorkshire, mm. and whenever I want to do an audio conference on my mobile phone, I have to sit there with an ear out of the window. <laughs> right? So, you know, I absolutely <laughs> sympathise and empathise in all the things. But there are some things you can do, right? Mm. Um, so speak to the provider and, you, you know, see how you can improve it. You can get technology stuff that enhances the signals. Um, but, yeah, you know, I'm a great voter for improved broadband out in rural areas. I think it's a, I think that's um, a time issue. I think I think things will improve and much sooner than she probably thinks. Um, the other option might be if she really she really is stuck to perhaps hire a desk. You know, there, there are business there are business units, aren't there? There where you can just hire a desk. Yeah, there are. But at look, certain times of the it, day. It, this is one of the things. You know, this is one of the challenges I had. Mm. You know, genuinely I had because mobile signal where I live does not work very well. Mm. And genuinely, the only place I get a mobile signal is on the landing window. Um, it is really worth taking out half a day mm -hmm. and then just getting a bit of advice of how can I improve things rather than just pulling your hair out and shouting, which you know I did for about three years before I sort of start taking advice, what do I do? And just one of the very simple bits of advice, I know it's not the broadband side, it was more a mobile signal, I got was, do you not realise you can divert your phone to your landline? And right. you know, dinosaur that I am, no I didn't. And that kind of solved a big problem very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I I've got an enhancer in the house mm -hmm. for the, uh, the broadband signal as well. Yeah, and certain providers are better in certain areas. Yeah. So it's always worthwhile yeah. finding out who has the most coverage in that area. Yeah. I know it's a really, really simple thing, but a lot of people don't check because they've been with a provider yeah. You assume for so long. that this yeah. is all there is, yeah. but actually this, mm. th there are different ways of doing things. Um, Howard Little in Eastleigh, I'm 45. I'm thinking about going freelance, but I'm worried about not having a regular income. Um, I mean, with that, and he's asking for any tips on that. It's not just, I suppose, about just having not having a regular income and, and having to budget, but it, I mean, also, how does it work in terms of things like, you know, getting a mortgage, for example, because they will want to see, you know, six months of payslips. So, what would you say to Howard? Uh, age forty-five now. Yeah, you've still got about another twenty years about worrying about not getting paid <laughs> regularly, <laughs> monthly. That's part of it, and you know, we all go through those cycles. Um, you know, if you're going to freelance, if you're going to run your own small business, it, you're doing it because that's what you want to do. You have can you get passion a mortgage, though? Yeah, you can get a mortgage. You can get a mortgage. It's a lot easier now than it was two or three years ago, actually, mm -hmm. for, um, I forget the words they use now, but self-assessment or self-certification. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, just be really upfront with the mortgage broker you're using. Try and keep the evidence of your bank account to show the money has come in. Show the accounts to show that you do actually earn the money. Um, so the, the, the lender will want, still want to see the evidence of that mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier to provide the evidence if you've just got a PAYE uh, payslip. I think it's more difficult if you're just starting out and, and imagining exactly what your yearly income yeah. might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think if you've been a freelancer for say a year or so, yeah, evidence, then you yeah. might know uh, the rough amount that you, you'll haul in yeah. in the year. And then I think you have to be quite disciplined about how much you spend. So if you have a spectacular month, then yeah. make sure you don't go and blow it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and just save some yeah. for next month because next month might not be so great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're coming to the end um, of this uh, live stream, but just, just a, a, a quick, um, answer from both of you on this. This is from Richard Copland in Nottingham. Which freelance industry will be the biggest in 10 years? Richard thinks it's going to be engineering. What do you think? Engineering and professional services, I would imagine. Um, I think a lot of um, professionals that have a, a, seem to have a much greater idea of themselves as a, as a standalone, standalone brand. Mm. Um, so certainly engineering, and we've, we've gone into construction as well, um, as the construction industry um, starts up again. I think you know there'll be a lot more people being um, employed on that basis, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's going to be a very, very wide-ranging, what wide-ranging trend. Mm -hmm. Peter, what do you think? I don't think we know today what the uh, biggest area will be in ten years' time because I suspect that that sector of whatever it is has not yet been developed properly. Right? Such mm -hmm. is the speed of change That's in the country. Yes. So, but it, you know, if, if you sort of pin me down and say, so what is it? Mm. I would say it's probably going to be a support sector to people working at home. Okay, interesting. 
Very lastly, a piece of advice for freelancers that you haven't already given. What would be your, the most important piece of advice that you would give to people who are either freelance or thinking of going freelance? Peter. When you get up in the morning, look in the mirror, smile and say, I enjoy doing this because it's a lonely place sometimes. <laughs> and only do it, genuinely only do it, mm. if you get up in the morning and say, do you know, I really enjoy doing this and I much prefer this to working for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So go out there and enjoy it. Jane? And have confidence, have confidence. Yeah. Um, don't see yourself as a shadow employee, as a yeah. substitute employee. You, know, you are a brand in your own right and have confidence in projecting that. Do you know, one thing that I have found is um, that as a freelancer, as somebody that goes in, whether you're a non-exec director, whether you're a consultant or a freelancer, when you go into a company and start giving advice, you will be amazed how much people stop and actually listen to you. So you, you, your value is really seen far more than were you a straight employee. It makes business sense, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you to both of you. Thank you to Peter Ibbotson, who's the Chairman of Small Business at the Royal Bank of Scotland, and to Jane Atherton, Business Editor of The Metro. And thank you to you for watching. Remember to tune back in to nationalfreelancersday.com tonight from 7pm to watch our live question time style debate streamed direct from London and featuring Karen Brady, Nick Ferrari and lots more famous faces from the world of business. For now though, goodbye.